Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in downtown Washington. And we have with us Tom Carrico, who is the man who watches all things missile defense here. Tom, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, as Bruce Klingner uh, over at the Heritage Foundation says, if you're covering North Korea, you do get a bit of job security at the, at the end of the day. Uh, talk to us a little bit uh, about uh, North Korea's most recent test, um, uh, certainly one of the more alarming ones, depending on how folks look at it in terms terms of uh, the potential range of the weapon. Talk to us a little bit about this test and why it has people so concerned this time around. Right, so this is the second uh, full-up demonstration of a real ICBM, uh, the last one being on July 4th, uh, the second one just now. Uh, the first one was sort of the 7,000, 8,000 kilometer range. This one appears to be a little more in the 10,000-ish range, uh, which means Mr. Kim uh, now has something that is demonstrated that would seem to be ranging uh, middle America, you know, the Chicago's of the world. Uh, and so it's, it's not hypothetical anymore. It is a demonstrated all up ICBM uh, capability. Uh, there's some questions about kind of the reentry side of things, but there's really no question that, you know, the pace of activity that we've seen over the last, especially three years or so, uh, is yielding capability uh, improvements for them. So what is um, the next step? A lot of uh, focus, a lot of recommendations on President Trump and the administration to start diplomatic courses of action, recognizing that the military course is a relatively limited one. The uh, administration did have a success in the B-1 flight that was escorted both by South Korean as well as Japanese uh, aircraft on each side, showing the tripartite nature of, of that. Talk to us a little bit about what are potential next steps in, in response to this that you guys over here are spending some time thinking about? Well, uh, I mean... It's not as if there's a whole lot of brand new diplomatic options that haven't been considered before. Uh, there may be some, some pressure, and this is, I think, what you are kind of hearing the Trump administration folks talking about of, hey, China, you all have additional levers uh, that you could potentially be pulling here. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if you were to do that? Uh, it may be that the United States has to cajole or even coerce China into doing that. Right now, they're kind of I think content to sit back and just sort of watch us twist, uh, but it could be that, in, especially in the secondary sanctions, uh, that, that we, we could apply pressure. They wouldn't like it, uh, but it's conceivable that, uh, that we could. China and Russia still seem to be in a little bit of a denial mode. I mean, Russia is still out there saying that the, the last two ICBM tests are, oh, nothing to worry about here, just sort of medium range, intermediate range missiles, um, uh, and they seem quite content to kind of let uh, North Korea continue on. Uh, so I think actually the, it's actually the other side of the coin is we actually in this kind of the B-1 flights kind of reflect this. No, we actually need to increase our military posture. Uh, you've heard many times before strategic patience has failed. And so in the absence of that, we're going to have to be ready for all these other things. We don't want that to happen. We want to make sure to communicate to North Korea that today is not a good day to upset the apple cart and have three countries very upset at you in, in short order. Um, the South Koreans did make a decision to increase the number of THAAD batteries in the country. Um, that in turn has the Chinese very concerned because they look at that as a radar that can look into China uh, and have gone so far as to accuse the South Koreans as exacerbating uh, the, the situation. Is that a big change and is that a sufficient defense uh, at this point from uh, a South Korean perspective? And I also want to get your views about um, Japan because there is concern whether that is going to be a sufficient defense when it comes to uh, Japan, for example. So actually what happened, what transpired with South Korea is in the wake of the two ICBM launches, South Korea said, hmm, maybe it would be nice to have the rest of those launchers within the Seoul 1 THAAD battery. Maybe it would be a good idea to put, deploy those after all. There would be a little bit of a kerfuffle, uh, a little bit of a, a political hemming and hawing about, well, we have a couple launchers out, maybe we... We should we could keep the rest in storage. I think China was really push, pushing on them for that. Uh, I think actually it's important to remember too that these are United States uh, paid for and operated Thad uh, a Thad battery, uh, not and, South and Korean. I, and I apologize for uh, you're right. We're talking about the launchers and not not anymore. So I apologize it's for easy that. to mix up, easy mix up. Uh, but it, it is a dis an important distinction because I think you have a single Thad battery. Why wouldn't you want a few more launchers? Why would you want to keep them in the barn? Uh, if you could be uh, having them fielded. Uh, and so in relative terms, North Korea's got a lot of stuff, a lot of short range, a lot of medium range stuff that they could throw. And so 
in relative terms, we ought to be trying to get more out there. I think we ought to be also asking, you know, what is it that our allies could be doing to build their own capacity in this area, uh, not merely relying upon the United States forces. We don't have that many fab batteries to go around globally, uh, so it's not like we're going to be able to surge a bunch more there uh, anytime soon. Uh, and what about Japan? Um, there are questions that the Japanese have noted that uh, the, the test vehicle landed in their um, economic zone. Uh, obviously, every country has def defines its own, um, you know, and certainly was no immediate risk to Jap Japan, Japanese property. or. But, you know, does Japan have the defenses in place to defend itself against a weapon like this? Uh, probably not. Uh, they've got some defenses, uh, but if you're talking about an ICBM that is going very fast, you know, Patriots, today's Patriots, probably not going to be configured to be sufficient to that threat. Uh, and so I think that's it actually kind of speaks to the importance of the cooperative effort between the United States and Japan to move forward uh, with the various standard missile and other programs uh, that we're jointly developing and jointly producing. Uh, that's going to give them a little bit, uh, well, actually a lot longer reach uh, to kind of kill these things early. Talk to us about the test that the U.S. test that was in Alaska uh, against intercepting a target. Um, what was the significance of that test and what was achieved? Okay, so you're talking about the, the most recent THAAD test. That was their, we've got a test range now in Alaska. It's actually the second THAAD test this month. So two ICBM tests this month, two THAAD tests this month. They are dis disconnected. Uh, you know, the THAAD in Guam is actually might have to defend against some longer range threats, but, but they are distinct. Uh, and so the THAAD is now, I think, 15 for 15. Uh, in its test record for the operationally configured system. That ain't bad. Uh, uh, but that kind of, they continue to give it more sophisticated threats and challenge it more. And I think you're going to see that capability uh, continue to evolve, hopefully. And in terms of continental um, defense, um, are the systems that we have in place sufficient to intercept something that is not just threatening, for example, Alaska, but the continental United States? Right. So that's, that's not the THADs or the Aegis. That's the uh, the bigger ones, the, the ground-based interceptors that are uh, at Fort Greeley, Alaska, and a handful in California. Uh, and guess what? They've been sitting there in silos since uh, 2004, uh, and they are, are postured there against just the kind of, of limited ICBM threat of a ballistic variety from North Korea that, that we've now seen demonstrated. Uh, so I think actually the combination of the successful tests and the, the last couple tests of GMD and now the couple uh, demonstrations of an ICBM, I think that kind of validates uh, both the prudence of having some kind of limited defense in the first place uh, and also the developmental path that the Missile Defense Agency is on right now. And any change in the estimate? I know that there are uh, debating estimates on how long it'll be before uh, the North Koreans will be able to put an ICBM on it. Some folks, a uh, nuclear weapon on this ICBM, excuse me. Some people see that as happening as early as next year. Some are saying, well, it's, it's, it's over the next couple of years. Still a relatively small time horizon. Has there been any change in those estimates yeah. uh, about how soon they're going to be able to nuclearize potentially these weapons? So uh, I think that the United States has already begun to, ha to operate and to, to act as if to act on the assumption that they could do this at any time, that that could manifest itself uh, at any time. Uh, we can't sort of sit around and twiddle our thumbs and wait for something else to happen before we do that. So, so in a way, we already assume that. Uh, there's so much uncertainty there that it would be imprudent to do anything else. And CSIS has been doing a great job on all sorts of visualizations. We, we talked to uh, to Todd and Gabe looking at the budget uh, visualization tool. Shout out to Gabe for helping shoot this. Uh, and, and talk to us a little bit about the missile defense version that you have where folks can look at what these arcs and these trajectories all all mean. Right. So I think you're you're referring to the uh, the simulations that we've been doing. Uh, actually this is this is really the aerospace security project that, that Todd Harrison directs. Uh, and his team have, have uh, we've been working with them to kind of put together uh, some visualizations of these high lofted trajectories that North Korea is doing on these things that would really, you know, make it a little bit harder uh, to, to intercept them. It, it's also the case you kind of you see how far they go, 3,700 kilometers into space. It's remarkable. Um, but somehow putting it on a screen with, with some colored lines helps to kind of appreciate that. Tom, thanks very much and always enjoy talking to you. Yeah, great to be here. Thank you.